In June of 1912, the U.S. appointed minister to Cuba sent a telegram to the U.S. Secretary of State saying that there had been violent clashes between white and black Cubans and that these clashes were expected to worsen. The confrontations did indeed worsen, and by the end of that year, an estimated 10,000 Afro-Cubans had participated in uprisings against the government. What conditions and events triggered these uprisings, and how did the U.S. and Cuban governments interpret the causes of these uprisings? In addition, how did both the U.S. and the Cuban government's interpretation of the goals of these protesters influence their actions against them? To explain the causes of these uprisings, we have to go back to the Cuban War of Independence against Spain from 1895 until 1898, which escalated into the Spanish-American War. Many Afro-Cubans had fought in this war and thus believed that the Cuban Republic owed them a rightful share in public jobs in return for their service to their country. During this war, the U.S. defeated Spain, forcing them to give up many of their territories in the Western Hemisphere, including Cuba, to the United States. In the early 1900s, the Cuban economy was still negatively affected by the war, and as a result, jobs and political opportunities were scarce, especially for black and mulatto Cubans, also known as Afro-Cubans. In response to feeling resentful over a lack of opportunities for jobs, education, and political influence, El Partido Independiente de Color, Independent Party of Color, or the PIC, was founded in 1908. The PIC spoke out against racism, nationalism, and corruption while working to defend worker, citizen, and peasant rights. Many of the leaders and members of the PIC felt as if they had been exploited for decades and that they had been robbed of their full rights as citizens, both during and after Spanish colonial rule. Following the creation of a Cuban Republic in 1902, the political elite showed very little interest in addressing issues of race and inequality, and instead, many white leaders addressed the so-called black problem with silence or discriminatory policies, such as refusing to appoint blacks or mulattoes in their newly created armies. The U.S. also contributed to the Cuban government's oppressive treatment of the PIC in numerous ways. Following the end of the independence war in 1998 until 1902, the U.S. maintained a provisional military government in Cuba. They placed many white leaders in power, and they also initiated a second military occupation from 1906 until 1909 to prevent clashes and rebellions among Cubans, as well as to maintain economic interests and to hold free elections. Many white Cubans feared black and mulatto political participation, and therefore greeted U.S. occupation and intervention with relief. Evaristo Esteños, the leader of the PIC, told members of the Cuban government that they had caused Cubans to believe that the PIC's only intention was to wage a race war, black against white. Esteños had also tried to negotiate with President Gomez and his administration, but his, his efforts were unsuccessful. A New York Times article from the time explained the government's response, quoting President Gomez as saying that he wanted to strike terror into the colored race and that he also wanted to pass a law that would suspend constitutional rights for rebels. In other words, both the U.S. and Cuban governments misinterpreted the PIC as staging uprisings simply for the purpose of racial hatred against whites, rather than acknowledging their long-held political and economic concerns. The U.S. eventually sent warships for the purpose of calming the situation down, but this aggressive act actually had the opposite effect. Though the Cuban government had a right to be angry about property loss and disorder that was occurring, the degree to which Afro-Cubans were massacred, along with the military support of the U.S., is reflective of a larger picture of how Afro-Cubans and their views were perceived in Cuban society. Overall, PIC protests stemmed out of many legitimate political and economic hardships, and it is clear that the U.S. and Cuban governments in many ways disregarded these concerns.